your Bibles to 2 Timothy, I'd like to read again from 2 Timothy chapter 2, read the first four verses, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, we began looking at this passage of scripture earlier, from 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul was writing to the young preacher, Timothy, and he calls him his son, he loved him very, very much, and He was preparing Timothy for all the different things that he would face as a minister of the gospel. He was warning him of the various kinds of persecutions and afflictions and troubles that he would have to face. But really most all of the things that Paul was writing to Timothy about, they are things that every Christian has to face. If they're going to follow Christ... They're going to face the same kinds of things that Timothy faced in his life. So we'd like to read now from 2 Timothy chapter 2 beginning with verse 1. The word of God says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God has chosen every one of you As his people who have been born of the Spirit of God, God has chosen you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. He redeemed you by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's going to carry you home forever. So that's one election or one choosing that God did in choosing you. But there's another choosing and that is that God has chosen you to be a soldier while you live here in this world. There are many of God's children that were chosen before the foundation of the world and are chosen to be soldiers, but they're not good soldiers. And this whole passage is talking about some of the requirements in order for us to be a good soldier. I want to be a good soldier. I want everybody here to understand it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. It doesn't matter how weak you are physically. You might not be able to function as a soldier in a natural army. But there are those that are flat of their backs and cannot even get out of the bed who are good soldiers of Jesus Christ. There are young children that may not be able to even read the Bible yet, but they are good soldiers of Jesus Christ. So I want us to understand that the warfare that we're talking about is different than the natural warfare, and yet there are a lot of similarities in a natural battle and warfare and the warfare that we have as children of God while we, while we live each day. We studied this morning in verse 3, the Word of God says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We cannot be a good soldier of Jesus Christ if we're not able to endure hardness. We looked at that. We looked at the necessity of us enduring. We looked at also the way that we can go about enduring hardness as a good soldier. Tonight, I'm going to go back to verse 1. Uh, verse 1 And verse 3 are very similar. Verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness. Verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want us to think first of all about that expression. That if you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you have to be strong. And the great danger is that you begin to feel strong. Because when you feel strong in your own strength, and you think that you're able to stand, the Word of God says, He that thinketh thinketh that he is able to stand, he better take heed lest he fall. 
So we need to understand that in and of ourselves, we are weak creatures. And when God tells us here to be strong, we need to understand that Jesus established this truth. Without me, what's the rest of that verse say? Without me, ye can do nothing. So I need to understand that without God's help, and I understand how, how weak and how frail I am, I need to understand without Christ, I can do nothing. And then Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I can do all things, all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So... I need to understand how weak I am without Christ, but I need to understand how strong I am and how strong I can be by the power of God. God has already told us in the first chapter here that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, the power, the only power that we have as Christian soldiers is the power that we get from God. The power and the strength that comes from God. You notice again verse 1. Thou therefore, look again at verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now that grace that you need and I need in order to be a good soldier, that grace comes from God. I mentioned this morning that Ephesians, I'm, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that we need to go before, let us come boldly before the throne of what? Grace. The throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help. Do you need help every day? Yes. Well, what can help you? It's the grace of God. It's the power of God that helps you to be a good soldier. And that's the reason he says here now, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's the grace of God that enables you to be a good soldier. It's the grace of God that enables you to be strong. It's in his grace and in his strength that we're able to be a good soldier. You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, the word of God says that just before he told us to put on the whole armor of God, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's the only way you can defeat the devil is by being strong in the Lord. That's the only way you can be a good soldier is if you look to God for the strength that you need. Every day you need to be praying, God, I need your grace. Back up in your Bibles very quickly, if you will, to back up to, uh, well, let's go forward just a moment to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, just four or five pages past where we're reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2, where the word of God says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you look in your Bibles now at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Listen carefully to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. The word of God says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed. What? What kingdom is that? What's that also called in the word of God? Most of the time it's called what? It's called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. He says we've received this kingdom. It came, you remember how Jesus taught us to pray? Thy kingdom come. And now Paul says we receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed. He, said us, he says let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why do we need grace to serve God? Because we can't serve God without his grace. We're weak without him. But with his grace, we can be a good soldier. With his grace, we can serve him. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can be strong. Doesn't matter what the devil puts on you. It doesn't matter how many problems you have in your life. You can overcome the devil. Doesn't matter how many afflictions he brings in your life. You can overcome all of those problems. But you can't do it by yourself. The only way you can overcome the devil and all the afflictions and problems and tribulations in this life is if you're looking to God for the, what's the five letter word? Grace. grace. You need grace every day. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace.
Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Was the Apostle Paul an extremely intelligent man, the Apostle Paul? Was he a smart man? Absolutely. Probably smarter than all of us combined. Paul was a very intelligent man. When he came to speaking different languages, he could speak a lot of different languages. When it came to the Jews' religion, he excelled most everyone in the Jews' religion. But you know what Paul understood? Paul understood how weak he was without God. Turning your Bibles now, back up a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want us to see and understand if we're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, it's essential that we look to God for the grace that we need. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the Apostle Paul talks about by the grace of God, he did a lot of things. Paul does that quite often. He talks about what he was able to do. But every time he talks about what he was able to do, he always emphasizes it wasn't he that did it by himself, but it was God giving the strength that he needed to be able to do that. You and I can be like Paul. We can be very successful as a Christian. We can be very successful as a soldier. Was Paul successful as a soldier of Jesus Christ? You remember one of the last things he wrote, wrote to Timothy? He says, I have fought a good fight. Uh, brethren, he has already established. He wasn't bragging there when he says, I fought a good fight. He's already established repeatedly. It's only by the grace of God I've been able to fight a good fight. It's only by God's power that I've been able to do what I was able to do. But he continuously kept going, going forward and getting stronger and being better as a soldier because he was looking to God for the strength and grace he needed every day. I want to be a better soldier before I leave this world than I am today. I want to be a better soldier. I want to serve him better. I want to be stronger than I am today. I believe with all of my heart, unless we get stronger, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get defeated. The forces of evil in America are getting stronger and stronger. And the only way you can overcome I'm telling you, brethren, by the grace of God, it doesn't matter how powerful the enemy becomes in America. It doesn't matter how strong the government, I'm talking about the evil government, it doesn't matter how strong they get, they cannot defeat you if you're looking to God for the strength and grace that you need every day. You can't wait until you're in the middle of a battle to start putting on the whole armor of God. You can't wait until the troubles come and then say, Oh God, I need grace now. Give me grace now. You've got to every day be growing. That's the last thing Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18. He says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more I grow in grace, the more I grow in the knowledge of Christ. The more I grow in grace, the better soldier I become. The more I grow in grace, the closer I get to the captain of my salvation. The more I grow in grace, the more I understand all about the battles of life. The more I grow in grace, the more I understand the enemy. The more I grow in grace, the more I'm able to defeat the enemy. The devil cannot touch me when I'm looking to God for the strength and grace I need every day. And that's the reason Paul, when he wrote to that young preacher Timothy, he says, Now you be strong, my son. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Listen now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as Paul talks about what he, what he did. And he did a good job, but he explains why and how he did it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10 he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's a profound statement. And brethren, he wasn't talking about his shortcomings here. He's talking about the reason he was able to excel in the ways he excelled. He says, just by the grace of God, I am what I am. I believe with this with all my heart. Whatever work you do, whatever business you have... It doesn't matter whether you're an auto mechanic. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher. It doesn't matter what your vocation is. I believe with all of my heart that you can be 
an outstanding position, an outstanding person in that position if you're looking to God for the strength and grace and wisdom that you need every day. And if you're not looking to God for the strength and the grace and the wisdom that you need, and you're not putting forth the effort that you need to be putting forth, then you're just going to bring shame and reproach on the cause of Christ. But if you look to God every day and you work hard and you labor hard, and you do the things that God requires you to do, and you look to Him for the grace that you need, you'll be strong. Not just in church, not just, I believe, in every, every area of your, life, of your life you will excel when you're looking to God for the strength and grace you need every day. I believe you'll see, wow, look what God did through me today. Wow, look at what God did today. And when you start thinking you did it, <laughs> let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Pride goes before a, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a what? A fall. Somebody sent me a video this week of this this woman. She was so proud going down the walkway. She was a she had on this dress and she was a model, and she was talking about, I mean, she, you couldn't hear any words, but you could just see, man, she's proud. She got to the end of the runway and started to turn around. Boom, she fell down and fell off the stage there. All, all I could think about, and I put a scripture on there. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh, by the way, I know a preacher that's like that sometimes too. You know him. All of us have to work on pride, don't we? You know when I have to work on pride the most? You know when I have to be most careful about pride? It's when God has lifted me up and helped me. Oh, God gave me a great victory today. Oh, God blessed me today. Oh, God bless my children. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're excelling. Look at how proud I am. And what will then happen? Down you'll go. So when God gives you the grace, and you use the grace, and you excel, you better be careful to give God the glory. And that's what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's the only reason he was able to do anything. The only reason he was able to leave the Jews' religion was because of the grace of God. The only reason he was able to excel as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ was because of the grace of God. It wasn't his book learning. It wasn't his intelligence. It was not his natural skills that caused him to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It was the grace of God that enabled him to be what he was. Nothing he learned from men, just the grace of God. By the grace of God, listen, listen now, look at all of that verse in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. By the grace of God, I, I am what I am. Every time that you excel in any area of your life, you need to say, and remember, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then he says this, and his grace which was bestowed upon me, have you ever had the grace of God bestowed upon you? You ever felt the grace of God? You ever felt the power of God? You ever help, felt that energy that comes from God? He says, in that grace, his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Is, does it sound like he's bragging there when he says, I labored? You might think that, but there, immediately he follows it up with, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. What's he giving glory to? He's giving glory to God, but what particular attribute is it that God's given to him that enabled him to do all those wonderful things he did? The grace of God. And that's the reason Paul knew by experience, he knew that God gave him grace. And he says, and that grace that was bestowed upon me was not bestowed upon me in vain. Can God give you grace and then you not use that grace? Absolutely. God can give you the grace to do everything you need to do and you do nothing with it. That's receiving the grace of God in vain. God gave you the ability. God gave you the power. God gave you the wisdom. He gave you everything you needed and you didn't use it. 
And that's what he talks about in 2 Corinthians. Turn quickly in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. He talks about, now Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, he says, I didn't receive the grace of God in vain. I used the grace of God. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Then he says in uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, he says this. He says, we then, as workers together with him... Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Now what did he say in 1 Corinthians 15? I didn't receive the grace of God in vain. What does he say in 2 Corinthians 6? I pray that you don't receive the grace of God in vain. What's he said to Timothy? Thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. Now, let's go back to 2 Timothy. I wanted to uh, look at one other statement. Turn back to 2 Timothy where we began. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've looked now tonight, at least partially, a little bit. We've looked at verse 1 which says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This morning we looked at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now verse 4. No man that warreth. What are, we, are we talking about a battle? A real battle? Yeah. A real battle. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. Now, listen, brethren, God chose you to be a good soldier. And you can be in the army of God, and then before you realize it, you can get entangled back there in the affairs of this life. Now, Paul was not telling Timothy don't work. He wasn't telling him that at all. The apostle Paul was a tent maker. But him being a tent maker was not his primary calling. Him being a tent maker did not interfere with his service to God. Him being a tent maker did not interfere with him preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Him being a tent maker did not affect what he preached. He didn't, he didn't cater to people so they'd buy his tents. You know what I mean? He preached the truth. And, and let the chips fall where they may. If they didn't want to buy his tents, that's all right. He wasn't going to compromise. He was not entangled in the affairs of this life. He didn't let the affairs of this life rule his life. He used those things so that he could preach the word of God. There are a lot of servants of God, a lot of preachers all through the years who have worked some to supplement their income. My grandfather and my great-grandfather, they traveled many, many miles without... My grandfather, Granddaddy Mims, he traveled mostly by train or bus, one of those two. I've got his little book at home. They were throwing everything out after he died. And, and I was out there at that barrel just pulling stuff out of the fire, you know. <laughs> I just like to save stuff. I'm sentimental. One of the things I found was a little book, a little black book. And he put, rode the bus to Savannah today. Got a bucket of potatoes and something else. <laughs> Next Sunday. Oh, and sometimes we put down, got a dollar and 42 cents. Or I got 38 cents. You understand? He just kept a daily record of where he went, how he got there. A lot of times he would go as close as he could get and then get off and walk the rest of the way and preach and then walk back to wherever it was that he had to get on the train or the bus and ride the bus back home. And you know what he did as a sideline, as a hobby, as a supplement to his income? He was one of the biggest grower of mums, flowers, in Georgia. He supplied... He supplied... Uh, plant nurseries all around South Georgia with these mums. They'd pull up there with their trucks and they'd just load up all those mums or a lot of the mums. He had about an acre behind his house that was covered with little black, uh, little black covering. Anyway, the, it, it gave some shade to the mums, but the rain could come through. I just want you to know, brethren, it's not wrong for a man of God to, to, to work. It is wrong 
For a man of God that's been called, whether it's you who's been called to be a soldier or me that's been called to be a soldier, doesn't matter whether my position or your position is different, whatever God's called you to do as a soldier, you better do it to the best of your ability and that better be number one in your life is serving God. All these other things that you might have to do, they should supplement your income. Your job should not be your vocation. <laughs> Your vocation should be a soldier of Jesus Christ. And just don't get entangled in the affairs of this life because if you get entangled in the affairs of this life, you can't be a good soldier. If you let your job, if you let your position, if you let the things that you do to work and make money, if that takes precedence over your service to God. Now listen carefully. You can, whatever your job is, you can be serving God on your job. You can be giving glory to God on your job. You can be a good soldier of Jesus Christ on your job. Just don't let that job control your life. Don't let that job take precedence over God and being a good soldier. That's when you're entangled in the affairs of this life. When, the, when Jesus Christ began his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, he came to Peter and Andrew, two brothers. Do you remember what they were doing? Matthew, back up in your Bibles very quickly. I want all the children especially to look at this. I want you to see that they were busy. It's good for you to be busy. Jesus never called anybody to be his disciple or apostle that wasn't busy. If you're lazy, you'll never be a good Christian. If you're not going to work and labor, you're never going to be a good Christian. You're never going to be a good soldier. You're never going to be good at anything if you're lazy. Matthew chapter 4, look at the word of God. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. The word of God says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. What was their occupation? Some of the children tell me. What was their occupation? Fisher, fishermen. They were fishermen. Next verse says, And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets. Do you hear the wording there? What did they do? They left their nets and followed him. Do you see that? Does that mean they never fished again? Doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean this. The number one thing in their life was no longer being a fisherman of fish. The number one thing in their life was to be a fisher of men. And even though they sometimes did go back fishing again, they never let that fishing entangle them. They never got entangled in the affairs of this life. They never got tangled up in those nets to the extent that it interfered with them being a fisher of men. Their number one goal, objective, their vocation was to be a fisher of men. Next verse, Matthew chapter 4 verse 21, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. You see what they did? They left the ship and their what? He didn't let family, he didn't let his job, he didn't let anything interfere with him following Jesus. It's wonderful to see God calling people to serve him. And whatever you do, while when he calls you, you may still do that sometimes, but just don't ever get entangled in the affairs of this life. Don't let them rule you. You ever seen a you ever seen a little bug get entangled in a spider's web? We've been battling honeybees again at our house. Any of you that want any honeybees, we've got them by the truckload in our logs. You just come and get all you want if you can get them out. Battled them. We battle them every year. Once a year, we start another battle with them. And, and one of the things I've noticed is We've got some cobwebs around on our front porch. You might not ever have cobwebs at your house, but sometimes we have cobwebs. But watching those bees get tangled up in one of those uh, spider webs, cobwebs, 
Well, when I see one of them get tangled up, I like to just sit down in a chair and say, go get him. <laughs> you know what happens every time a bee gets tangled up in that web? You know what happens? The bee comes out, I mean, the, the spider comes out. The spider comes out. Now, he might let him fight. He'll let him wrestle. He'll let him fight. He'll let him just keep going and going and going until he wears out. And then here comes the spider. And if, if the spider gets close and the bee starts fighting again, he just backs off a little bit. Go ahead, buddy, wear yourself out. And then he finally goes up, bites the, sp bites the bee, and that's the end. You know what will happen to you and to me if we get entangled in the affairs of this life? The devil will come and he'll destroy your life. Oh, you, you can fight it, you can fight it and fight it. But when you're entangled in the affairs of this life, you can't be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. I pray that God will help me and you to understand if I want to be a good soldier, what's Ephesians, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 2.1, what does 2 Timothy 2.1 say? Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What do he say in verse 3? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What do he say in verse 4? He said, No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has called him to be a soldier. May God help us to be thankful he's called us to be a soldier, and may God help us to be faithful to the captain of our salvation is my prayer for Christ's sake.